what I think 2024 is going to look like. I believe it's going to be a disaster. Um, I'm somewhat surprised that we've gotten out or we're getting out of 2023 in one piece. When people ask me how much should I put into gold and silver, my standard answer now is whatever you don't want to lose. And the reason I say that is because gold and silver cannot bankrupt and everything else in the system, including the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Treasury, all central banks across the globe, any and all can default, whether it be by non-payment or just massive overprinting of the currency to debase it, you know, 50 percent, 75 percent, 90 percent, whatever. In the midst of what financial analyst Bill Holter describes as the end times financially, he advocates a strategic shift toward assets that stand resilient against defaults. His counsel to individuals centers on allocating some of their investment portfolios to gold and silver, a sentiment echoed by recent market movements. The price of gold has surged to a multi-week high, surpassing $2,060, driven by a confluence of factors. The benchmark 10-year U.S. Treasury bond yield remains in negative territory below 3.9%, bolstering the bullish momentum for gold. In tandem, silver prices have reached $24.50 per ounce, marking the highest level since December 5th, as dollar-denominated metals futures gain ground. The financial landscape has been marked by the sudden collapse of several high-profile regional banks in the spring of 2023, including Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, Signature Bank, and First Republic Bank. This unsettling development underscores Holter's assertion that physical assets like gold and silver may offer greater resilience in times of economic turmoil than paper-based investments. Holter's perspective aligns with the strategic moves made by the BRICS alliance, which has sought to challenge the supremacy of the U.S. dollar by backing its new currency with gold. China, Russia, and India, critical members of BRICS, have significantly increased their gold reserves in 2023. This accumulation of precious metal serves as a financial buffer as the alliance expands, with six new countries joining in August, resulting in a combined gold holding of 6,600.23 tons in their central banks. President Putin's emphasis on fair and free settlement, coupled with the gold accumulation strategies of Russia and China, suggests a deliberate challenge to the dominance of the U.S. dollar in global financial dynamics. Let's delve into key moments from Bill Holter's interview with these video clips. Gold and silver used to be cash. And the place to be when there was going to be a, a bear market, a, a market downturn was cash. And that was gold and silver. The, the idea today, if you put your money in cash, it's got to be in a bank. It's got to be in a brokerage account. It's got to be in a money market. You have counterparty risk. The paper itself, uh, you're going to see massive defaults, but you're also going to see defaults of the systemic players. I mean, I don't know whether you have read or agree with the great taking. I think it's pretty spot on. And I think they're going to tank banks, brokers, insurance companies, even exchanges. That's the plan. And people are going to end up with nothing. My suggestion, and, and I've said this for uh, four or five years now, when people ask me how much should I put into gold and silver, my standard answer now is whatever you don't want to lose. And the reason I say that is because gold and silver cannot bankrupt and everything else in the system, including the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Treasury, all central banks across the globe, any and all can default, whether it be by non-payment or just massive overprinting of the currency to debase it, you know, 50 percent, 75 percent, 90 percent, whatever. So I, I think anyone who says that you should not have all your eggs in one basket. 99% of the time, that's true. These are the end times financially. If you heed the words of Richard Russell, Richard Russell always said, in a, in a severe bear market or you know, in a depression, the one who loses the least is the winner. I mean, it's, to me, it's a no-brainer. You, you want your, your capital in something that cannot default and also cannot be taken away from you. Um, so I think, you know, gold and silver is what you should consider your cash. Um, as far as cash, cash, I've told people they should keep maybe 5,000, 10,000 on hand. And when the shit hits the fan, go out and spend it as fast as you can. It'll go to a premium for a couple weeks, maybe four weeks. But at some point in time, people are going to figure out, hey, I'm not going to get something real for a piece of paper that's monopoly money.
I do want to uh, mention a couple things of, of what I think 2024 is going to look like. I believe it's going to be a disaster. Um, I'm somewhat surprised that we've gotten out or we're getting out of 2023 in one piece. I think it's very important to keep in mind uh, the BRICS as of January 1st will be headed by Russia, thus Putin. He says that he wants fair and free settlement. You can follow what Russia has been doing, what China has been doing. They've been buying gold. They've talked about a gold-backed currency. I think the dollar will be torpedoed in 2024. We just had uh, six additional uh, nations join, uh, two very important ones. One is Saudi Arabia. The other is the UAE. Saudi Arabia, a year and a half ago, came out and said, we will accept other currencies than just dollars. And just a few weeks back, the UAE came out and said, we will accept foreign currencies, but we will not accept dollars. And France is talking about interest rates spiking. I think he's absolutely spot on because as it stands or as it stood in the past, the U.S. Treasury was considered a risk-free investment. Starting, like I said, January 1st, there is, there is, it's a new ball game. There's a new sheriff in town. I do believe they're going to push the dollar over the edge and there will be a risk adjustment, if you will, to the interest rates that the United States has to pay. The recent data on the so-called core PCE price index reveals a notable development in inflation trends. The index advanced by 3.2% year on year marking the smallest rise since April 2021, following a 3.4% increase in October. The Federal Reserve closely monitors the PCE price measures as part of its strategy to achieve a 2% inflation target. Additionally, the government reported that core PCE inflation saw a 2.0% annualized rate in the third quarter. Financial analyst Bill Holter underscores the widespread impact of inflation, emphasizing that a significant majority estimated at 80 to 85 percent of the population, is feeling its effects. This impact is particularly pronounced for most wage earners, contrasting with the top 5 or 10 percent. Examining the performance of major stock indices, including the Dow Jones Industrial Average, S&P 500, and NASDAQ Composite, reveals a heightened level of uncertainty when assessed over several months to a couple of years. Despite occasional positive fluctuations, all three indices have experienced oscillations between bull and bear markets in recent years. Holter expresses that the nation is already in a recession, a sentiment supported by the anticipation of an impending stock market crash. While such a crash may temporarily boost tax revenues through capital gains, it is expected to usher in a subsequent downturn. Let's get back to the interview. People experience difficulty personally. Once they experience the, uh, the personal difficulty, then they start looking for the reasons why, and obviously inflation is a big reason. Uh, and I think it's I think it's a, a far larger number than than you might suspect of, of people that are are definitely feeling the pinch. I'm going to say probably 80, 85 percent. I mean, unless you're in the top five or 10 percent of wage earners, inflation bites. Does it bite the top five percent? Yes, somewhat, but but not drastically. So it's it's, it's really a, a large, a huge majority is feeling the bite of inflation. And I would add to that, they're also feeling the bite of higher interest rates because, I mean, look at anybody who owns a home. If they want to move, will they move knowing that whatever loan they get, if they have to have a, get a loan, is going to be much higher? That's the first part of it. Then the second part of it is buyers, I mean, they've had their knees cut off from under them. What? An income that would have supported a million dollars in borrowings two years ago now only supports five, six hundred thousand dollars. So it's a double whammy. I think people are definitely feeling it. There is this it, it is a wake up call. Now, does the average person know what to do about it? Probably not. I mean, the average I mean what's the ownership of of gold and silver in the United States? One percent or less? Um, even if it's two percent. And I think the credit event, even for the average person now, they can see the math. Uh, we went for how many years? 25 years with the debt service uh, of the U.S. Treasury between, call it, 350 and 450 billion a year. 
Now we're at a trillion dollars, but in the next year or two, we're going to be at a trillion and a half, two trillion. At the same time, as Francis mentioned, the tax receipts are, uh, they're starting to weaken. If you look at valuations and equities, I mean, they're, they're sky high during, in my opinion, we're already in recession. We are at some point in time going to have a stock market crash which will give one big boost in one year tax revenues for people taking capital gains when they're, when they're forced to sell. After that, then you're gonna see tax revenues dry up drastically because the selling will have been done. The economy itself, it's not generating, it's slowing down. It's not generating the tax revenue that it normally would. So I just think the biggest thing this year was the unmasking of the mathematics, if you will, I mean, go back to what, 2002, 2003, Dick Cheney said deficits don't matter. I think the average person is going to is finding out already that, yeah, in fact, they do matter. They've piled up and now higher interest rates have exposed the, the, the mathematical problem. How do recent market movements, notably the surge in gold prices and the strategic moves by the BRICS alliance, reflect the growing concerns about the financial landscape? In the face of the sudden collapse of regional banks in 2023 and the assertion by financial analyst Bill Holter that these are the end times financially, what role do physical assets like gold and silver play in providing resilience against economic turmoil? Share your thoughts in the comment section. If you liked the video, please subscribe to our channel and remember to activate notifications by hitting the bell icon. Your participation means a lot to us. Thank you.